My name is Mary Conquest. I'm your host for Safety Labs by Slice, the podcast where we explore the human side of safety to support safety professionals. We move past regulations and reportables to talk about the core skills of safety leadership, empathy, influence, trust, rapport. In other words, the soft skills that help you do the hard stuff. Hi there. Welcome to Safety Labs by Slice. One way to develop a skill is to learn from an expert. The organizational equivalent for safety work would be to look at companies that are doing it right. And that's exactly what our guest today talks about within the framework of high reliability organizations or HROs. Jody Goodall has been in the safety profession for 20 years. Her operational experience spans mining, defense, explosives, heavy maintenance, and logistics. Jody is head of organizational reliability at Brady Haywood, a consultancy in Brisbane, where she collaborates with boards and senior management in high hazard industries. Her goal is to help leaders shape their organizations to work in ways that prevent fatalities and major accidents. Jody's approach is based on systems thinking and the practices of high reliability organizations. And she joins us from Brisbane. Welcome. Hey, Mary. How are you going? Good, 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 good. So let's start by talking about what you mean when you say high reliability organization. Now, it may be because it's not my industry, but when I first heard the term, all these questions came to mind. Is every company in a high risk sector like mining or aerospace considered high reliability? Are there HROs in lower risk industries? Is there an official designation of some kind? Or is it just sort of a shorthand for doing high risk activities? So put all my questions to rest. (laughs) All right. Well, I suppose every uh, organization that's in a high hazard industry would hope to and strive to be highly reliable. And, you know, the original theory was built off uh, understanding, it was back from the 80s, and it was really about understanding what are the characteristics that are common in the, you know, that top of the cream of those sectors that get it right all the time. And, you know, those sectors are nuclear, they're, you know, um, they're, they're a lot of power generation, um, petroleum and gas, uh, some parts of mining that have, you know, I suppose big process safety risks like strata failure, um, gas explosion, things like that. Yeah, so there are certainly, you know, it, uh, as like every industry, there's a, a spectrum of of, um, of people who are doing it really, really well and ones that aren't, aren't doing it so well and, and they're the ones that seem to be in the news all the time, the ones that aren't doing it so well. Um, but those ones that get it right, that are highly predictable and reliable, they have um, a lot of characteristics that are the same and that's what was originally studied back in the 80s. And, um, you know, they kind of came up with five uh, characteristics and those have been, you know, I would say the safety theories and um, and practices that we're hearing about now, things like HOP, um, you know, resilience engineering, all of those things um, fit beautifully into the high reliability framework as well. I, but, uh, but they're not characteristics that belong specifically to high hazard industry. You know, there are a lot of industries that are just really complex, Mary, as well. So, you know, you might think of those like healthcare um, is a really good example, emergency services. And, you know, what we've seen over the years is actually a lot of um, the high reliability um, organisation, I'll call it HROs, that's okay. The HRO theory and practice and a lot of the papers that have been written in the last, you know, 10 or so years have actually been, come out of healthcare. So those guys are really, uh, you know, uh, taking those, the theory and the practice and, and building on it and testing it in their highly complex environment. So in short, I would say it's a set of practices or characteristics uh, that fit in organised, um, that came out of high hazard industry, but certainly are being used across uh, highly complex um, industries as well. So it started more as descriptive, just descriptive, like someone, it was studied and, and found commonalities between these organizations. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. They came up with kind of five characteristics. They're really around that ability, the mindset of the organization to have a preoccupation with failure. And, uh, you know, they're always chronically uneasy about yesterday's success and um, and thinking that, 
you know, they know their organisation changes all the time and it's very dynamic. So they're always thinking that failure is kind of on the cusp and, um, and how will they identify that and manage it in advance. Um, they certainly are very, you know, they're reluctant to simplify the information that's coming to them so they don't dumb stuff down, they don't think about things as the, you know, what's immediately in front of them. They're always thinking about it from a systems perspective um, and they're certainly uh, sensitive to their operations. So, you know, typical organisations will have this hierarchy where, you know, the leader believes that they um, have all of the information and um, and understand what's going on, but in a in a HRO, very much thinking about uh, what's going on at the front line and transparency of information right through the system. So they're very sensitive to what's going on uh, at the front line, um, and that's kind of the three characteristics that make them be able to anticipate failure really well. And um, and then there's a couple more which are around resilience and um, um, having a real commitment to being able to contain issues and recover quickly and then certainly deferring to the experts is something that you see, which is pretty unusual in a lot of other uh, other uh, types of organisations. Yeah, well, we're, we're going to go through each, one's, each one of those and I'll have you explain it so we can really understand it. How did you come to look at HROs and, and who should pay attention to HROs and, and how they handle operations and why did it, why or how did it pique your interest? It piqued my interest when I was working back in defence, actually. I think, uh, you know, the US Navy is um, and US nuclear are known as as HROs and certainly there is a lot of talk in, in Australian defence about the concept of HRO. And, you know, back in the day, 20 years ago, I did study it at uni and um, and the theories make sense. They really do. When you start to turn those things into practice, it's it becomes, you know, it's very obvious that they're the things that, you know, that in a complex environment, you, you can't just build a system and expect that it's going to work every day like that. You really need to keep learning about how it's changing. And so people that need to be really sensitive to this stuff, I would say are the top level leaders in a business. These are these are theories that really help leaders understand why they can't um, you know, just put a set of procedures um, in front of in front of a bunch of workers and expect them to follow it because, you know, every day is different. Uh, they're constantly adapting, all of those things that you um you would know from um your other speakers. But uh, so you know, I think these are these are leadership theories that really help people dissect and understand complex um, business. Specifically with safety, fatalities are the worst possible outcome for any organization. So you would think that businesses would pour a lot of resources into understanding the risk in uh, potentially fatal areas or operations. Do you find that to be the case? And if not, why would that be? Or if so, why would it be? Yeah, look, I work with a lot of organisations. Most of them are in kind of mining, oil and gas, um, but also uh, regulators. And and I think everybody has the right intention. You know, I really don't, don't yeah. And there is a lot of um, resources and money and effort going into uh, thinking about how do we get better at safety. But we're so, um, you know, we're just creatures of habit and we – it's very easy to go back to the behavioural piece and think that it's the workers, you know, if we can fix the worker, we'll fix everything. And I think that's the great thing about the HRO theories is because they they really take it away from that and not just say, you know, hop, hop is beautiful in the fact that it um, are human organisational performance theories um, and principles that, you know, that really leads you to ask the worker, you know, how they adapt, what's not going right for them, that kind of stuff. But, you know, as a leader, there's so much more that you need to build into your system to make it to make it easy for people to, you know, for things to go right. And, and that starts back with how you define your key performance indicators, really understanding, you know, goal, fl- goal conflict. There are, there are so many pieces of the puzzle that a leader needs to be thinking about but unfortunately very traditionally it's very easy to spend money on compliance and behavioral observation programs and things like that that you know we know we know don't work we know they just give the leader comfort it's just like um you know that whole concept of disciplining a worker 
um, if they make a mistake, that just gives the leader comfort, you know, but it doesn't actually fix the system. And so, you know, I think um, we spend a lot of, we're, we're still spending too much time on traditional safety methods that we know don't work. I think it's interesting that, you know, we, on this show, we do end up talking about a lot of different sort of newer approaches, safety differently, new view, safety too, and all of that. And, and there are discussions about, you know, how they're the same, how they're different, um, which is better, which is worse. But it's interesting to me that it seems like this framework kind of already encompassed a lot of the stuff that we're now talking about is different. Yeah, you're right. I um, I kind of do laugh at, at all the different theories because they're all bits and pieces of um, of HRO theory, if you ask me. And and it's really easy to observe that when you start to just observe good practice in organisation and you can see that, you know, how beautifully the hot principles fit into, as I said, that um, number three, sensitivity to operations, because that's really what it's all about is understanding the worker. And number five, which is uh, commitment to resilience, hop, uh, sorry, HRO theory, that is resilience engineering. And, you know, safety too is is dotted all the way through there. So, um, you know, I'm certainly not um, you know, hardline any of those. Um, I think I think they all overlap themselves. And whilst everyone's kind of maybe peddling their own their own thing, if um, we just kind of as an industry and as a profession, it'd be so lovely for us just to start to think about what are the practices associated with all of these theories, and and really just recognise that we're all actually heading in the same direction. And yeah, yeah, I do. I hear that a lot from guests is, you know what, it doesn't matter what you call it. Let's just, <laughs> let's yeah. just move forward. <laughs> yeah. So let's get into these five characteristics as you've presented them before. I'd like to go through each one and just sort of ask you, what does it mean? What is its significance? And maybe how does it look in practice? Yep. Okay. So the first one is a preoccupation with failure. What does that yeah. mean? Yeah. So preoccupation with failure is I suppose the primary thing that, you know, if we're working with clients, we always start with as well because it's the mindset that, you know, HROs have. And, you know, if we stand back and think about what a normal organisation does, a normal organisation, you know, they build systems and processes, incident. You can go into any organisation, you will find an incident reporting system, you'll find risk management tools, you'll find a maintenance um, system that manages, you know, the equipment, you'll find KPIs, all of those kind of things. It doesn't matter what organisation you go into, pretty much they'll all have it. And so that's a normal organisation. And then then they'll have a big failure and that organisation will, you know, just say they have a fatality event, uh, Mary, They what will happen is they'll bring somebody in and what they'll find is shock horror, that things they already knew that, the audits that they were doing were already highlighting these issues, that they had a backlog of their maintenance, that they had incidents that are in the system that they've been capturing that are almost identical or that are having the same control failures as the fatality. And, you know, this is really common and it's repeated in all of the big failures in uh, over and over in um, in the world. And, and HROs see all of those things that um, were found in the nor- normal organisation. They see those as warning signs of failure and that's what they're – and, you know, they understand that their system is really fallible and that they're continually going to find those things. And so they see those as – they have a healthy scepticism about, about those warning signs and they understand that – they're the things that are going to prevent fatality. So they see them as good news and they're continuously looking for them. So that's really what a preoccupation with failure is all about. It's really about constantly being vigilant and having a healthy scepticism about how your risks are being managed and recognising that when you, you know, when you get an incident report that says you've had a failure or when you get a bad audit or, um, you know, somebody says, I don't you know, this this equipment doesn't work in this particular work scope, you know, they see that as, aha, thanks for telling me, amazing, system didn't work, that's great, we can fix that, uh, you know, it's not seen as bad news or trouble or, or any of that kind of stuff. So, you know, and it's really difficult to get that. So if you're a, if you're a leader in, that, in a business and this is something that um, you see in mining quite a bit is, uh, you know, leaders will allocate a certain 
amount of equipment. They'll put in, um, you know, work teams that they think are competent. They'll overlay it with procedures. And then when it doesn't go right, it's seen as bad. But actually, it's this is a really good opportunity to learn and explore and, um, you know, this concept of chronic unease, which is preoccupation with failure really, this chronic unease about having a healthy scepticism about how your risks are being managed, it's very much just very different to how a normal organisation would would act. Um, there are a number of things that practices that you see in organisations that, um, that encourage chronic unease so, or preoccupation with failure. You can use those terms interchangeably, sorry, Okay, I was going to ask at the at the end of this how chronic unease fits in. So, is it one and the same, or is it um, just a lot so, of overlap? Yeah. Um, so, there's obviously the preoccupation with failure, which is really about building. It's the it's the number one part of the theory, but the mindset that sits with that is a real is a chronic unease. So, it's a psychological process. It's of individuals, but a good HRO will build um, the practices into their organisation that makes everybody have chronic unease. And, you know, those kind of things are like, you would have heard these, uh, encouraging um, teams to have really good psychological safety uh, within the teams. So being able to express alternate opinions, um, report incidents, stop work if you're feeling unsafe or you feel like something's not right, you know, those kind of things. So there's psychological safety, you build practices around um, having systems that detect warning signs of failure. So what you'll see in a normal normal organisation is they compartmentalise all of their data sources. So, you know, you have your incidents um, separate to your um, critical control monitoring, which is separate to your maintenance equipment, you know, backlog. But realistically all of those things need to come together to be able to see the patterns of failure and um and that's really you know something that um is if you can build that into your organization and you can see those patterns make them vivid really easy you start to have chronic unease naturally because you can see things failing you know so yeah psychological safety detecting warning signs of failure um there's a couple more oh having a real questioning attitude so, um, you know, you'll see HROs when they want to have, when they're trying to encourage this preoccupation with failure, they're really questioning green days. So, you know, if they've had a run of success um, and things are going really well, that's kind of a, a time to have heightened awareness because they know that things could be being normalised, stuff like that. Yeah. And the last thing you see um, which encourages chronic unease and, and this preoccupation with failure is fundamentally the organisation right through from the very um, top, the board, all the way through the uh, experts and and the frontline experts, the workers, uh, you really see risk competence. So everybody not just understands the risk, but they know what the control, how the controls fail, how these, um, you know, big events are caused. There's a lot of um, talk and, and discussion all the time um, around failure, around how these things happen. And that, you know, naturally when you're talking about failure all the time and keeping those things alive, um, it's really quite easy to have a chronic unease and be able to start to identify when things aren't going right. Yeah. So it sounds like a pretty hectic place to be, doesn't it? <laughs> well, I was thinking a couple of things. One, that chronic unease sounds almost like anxiety and yet the way you describe it, it's not it's not anxiety. I think skepticism is probably a better word, and and even like happiness at the opportunity to see these red flags and to learn from them. Like yeah. it's a new relationship with red flags. I would say, absolutely, but, yeah. But I'm curious about how how to make that shift. Like that's a huge mindset shift, and ch- changing one person's mindset is difficult. Changing an organizational mindset is really really difficult do you have any um observations about that or yeah um when we start working with companies they they may have had a couple of serious accidents but they really uh you know as i said before if you if you can get all of the information that you've already got in your um in your organization all your data sources and you can start to overlay those patterns becomes easy for the leaders to see that things are failing 
So um, sometimes it's really just about making the data sources meaningful that you have and um, and showing the patterns. And uh, I can't remember her last name. First name's Linda. It'll come to me. Um, she is a researcher from the Netherlands and she did a piece of work uh, with the must be the regulator over there and she looked at thousands and thousands of serious accidents um, near misses and what she found was do you remember the old the old Heinrich triangle that everybody would talk about where it's got fatalities injuries um, um, minor injuries and that there's supposed to be a correlation there um, you know I think that's kind of been disproven in, in some ways but what she found is that you can take all of the little control failures in your business. If you understand one primary hazard, so let's, when I talk about primary hazards, let's talk about electricity, for example, or gas would be another one. And you can look at, you can indicate and predict your higher level failures by understanding, if you very clearly understand what controls you have in place to manage those failures, and then you start to look for when those controls are failing, actually they will give you beautiful patterns about when you're going to have a serious accident. And so, yeah, so we help organisations really, or, or it's a passion of mine is starting to help organisations to really set, um, pull their data apart and start to look at it in terms of primary hazards and then deeply understand your risks, how you control them, what they look like when they're out of control and what your sources are to, to collect that information and then you can start to see those patterns and, and, you know, that would be one way of starting to get leaders because it's factual and, you know, if you're working with companies that are highly engineering-based, things like that, you know, all the fluff goes out the window and they just want to see the data. So, you know, you start to show them that and talk about how that all fits together and they can see, you know, small failures lead to big failures. Um, so that's an, one way of making that link. The other way is... I suppose initially, as I said, about building practices. So, you know, you can teach, you can actually teach people how to have a better questioning attitude. And, you know, we, we, we get boards role-playing, giving and receiving tough questions uh, to each other and to do that in front of their executives and then their executives start to do that in front of, you know, other people. And when you're rewarding those practices, like they're the things you should be rewarding, not, not less incidents. But um, all of that drives a culture in the business of, um, of having a preoccupation with failure and chronic unease. I was just thinking there too that if you understand, um, you can picture a, an organization where someone says, what is this measure? I don't know. It, it measures this thing. Why? I don't know. Well, that's, that's the lack of, you know, the connecting the dots between, okay, what are our controls like? Why are we measuring this? And what does it actually mean? Yeah. <laughs> that's... Yeah. That's sort of the patterns that you're talking about in a sense. Absolutely. So a couple of years ago, uh, Grosvenor Underground Coal Mine in Queensland had a, um, had a gas explosion that um, injured five really severely. And, uh, you know, some of those, those guys will never be the same again. Um, some of them lost ears and, you know, had um, extreme lung issues and, and burns to a lot of their body and just very lucky that uh, that they didn't die. Uh, very lucky, came very close. Um, but, you know, the, there was a lot of information um, in the public circle around that because there was a board of inquiry around it. So it's a really good and recent case study on exactly what you're talking about. So when you uh, overlay the years before that event, they were having um, gas exceedances. So they were actually exceeding the... Um, the limits to uh, what would come into an explosive um, atmosphere. And it had happened so many times and they were explaining it away in terms of they would find the individual control failure and they wouldn't link it back to a, a, a larger kind of inherent issue. And so they were normalising the failures. And, you know, if, if you don't have a clear understanding of each of your metrics, and why you're measuring things and why they're at the limit they're at, then because you don't often get a bad outcome, um, it's very, very easy to see those as uh, we had success rather than we had failure. And I think that's another example of the difference between a HRO is a HRO would see that as 
oh my goodness, I have a pattern of failure here. I need to think about this and escalate this and do something um, broader rather than just band-aid the individual um, issues. Okay, well, let's let's move on to the other the other characteristics here. So the next one is a reluctance to simplify. Yeah, actually, we've probably just tackled that one a little bit more with the um, with the Grosvenor explosion. So, you know, what you I suppose a, a reluctance to simplify the interpretations of the information that you're getting is is really about this whole compartmentalizing thing, and it's also about simple explanations for failure. So it's really easy for an organization. We know that when we have a failure, it's very easy that to re- to um, explain it away by saying, you know, the last person to be at the scene was was the person that made the mistake or made the error, and you know, if we think about things in term, terms of just human error, what we um, what happens is, is we don't get the richness of actually the full system's failure and so the error will repeat itself over and over again because we're putting people back in that same situation um, to repeat that, you know, same issue. So, um, you know, HROs are really, really good at thinking about failure and about how things go right as well in terms of um, a system's perspective and understanding even though the proximity of the, um, you know, the senior leaders and the decisions they make might not be so clear to that failure, um, it's they need to look for those links and they're continuously doing that. And if they don't have – the other thing you see with HROs, which is really interesting, is they might have a really good outcome. Um, so I worked with a mining company a few years back that um, – they were mining, they were getting a higher level of, um, of their uh, mineral that they were mining than they expected and they saw that as a failure. They were like, okay, so even though we are smashing it here and we are way above our targets, we don't understand this failure, we don't understand this success and not understanding is just as important as a failure. You know what I mean? They see that as, as one and the same. And, you know, that they're the kind of behaviours that you see in HROs is, um, is this, I must understand everything because that makes me more reliable, more predictable. Yeah. I mean, it would be so tempting to just say like, yay, we're, we're uh, without understanding, like I can absolutely see how, how that would happen. And also there's a difference between like, sorry, a difference between success and lack of failure, right? Like, yes, I mean, what I mean is... I guess what you're talking about, right? Like this, this measurement is always high, higher than what we've been told is the acceptance tolerance, but there's, there's a lack of failure. It's nothing bad has ever happened. And so, but we'll interpret it as success. That's the simplification there, right? Yes, that is. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You nailed it. Hmm. Okay, good. Glad. <laughs> um, so the next one, and this is where I think uh, HOP or HOP comes in. You've mentioned before is a sensitivity to operations. Yeah, so it definitely fits in here. I mean, HOP is is a set of principles. People um, make mistakes, blame fixes nothing, you know, the leader response matters. All of those things fit beautifully into being very connected to your front line and what's really going on at the, at the coalface or the work front. So HOP is all about understanding um, how work is done and making it easier for successful work. But you know, the other part to that is the leader has a responsibility to transfer information and to um, be across all of those things to help them make better decisions as well. So, you know, whilst HOP is very worker focused, um, you know, I think HRO is driving the leader to understand that they have a role in um, in this process as well. And um, it's not just about asking the worker what they need. It's about um, being the providing good um, decisions and equipment and all of those things up front, like being proactive around that as well. So, and to really deeply understand that, you know, one of the things um, in, with HROs is is worker experience and expertise is very, very important because obviously, you know, you're working in high hazard or complex environments and, you know, you think about healthcare, for example, the frontline workers are the most experienced, you know, they are the ones that, um, that, totally understand what's going on but the leaders um, very clearly recognize that they are a support mechanism and that but they have a responsibility to make a great system um, for people to be able to uh, respond and and react um, as well so you know I think it's hop 
plus it turns it on its head and says, hey, leader, don't just um, don't just wait, drive an excellent outcome and make sure you're letting, you know, seeing your workers as the people that need the information, current, up to date, you know, the best information and access to experts as well. So. Also, I'm sure you've heard, everyone has heard the work is imagined as opposed to work is done. So it sounds to me like HROs are just not even, I, I mean, they're not so concerned about work as imagined. They're really, really focused on work as done all the time. HROs? Yeah. Does that make yeah. Does that scale? Yes and, yes and no. I think um, as, you, as the work gets more complex and, and more, um, there are fewer ways to get success. You know, I would say that, you know, the black line, which is perfect system, perfect work, perfect, perfect day, and then blue line, which is how people need to adapt to the system, they are very interested in understanding that. Um, and for the critical steps of the job. So if you're working in, um, you know, um, creating chemicals, for example, there are critical steps uh, when you're blending chemicals or um, refining things that absolutely can't be deviated from. And so that's where the blue line can't be different to the black line. And um, they're just very interested in the sensitivity is about understanding where is it you need to deviate because we need to understand exactly when you need to deviate and why not you have that freedom to do it so i think there's a very there's also probably another level in terms of the black line blue line which is these are my critical steps along that line and um and they really you know i suppose leaders and workers are very clear on what those steps are and and help understand you know there's um, transparency when those things might need to deviate um, so that they can um, not deviate, I suppose, yeah. So sometimes um, it's easy, we allow work as imagined, but uh, but sometimes it's about really coming back to, uh, oh, sorry, work as done, but sometimes it's about coming back to work as imagined. Mm. In the critical, yeah, in, in the critical steps and uh, critical controls, I suppose. Okay, let's move on to number four, which is a commitment to resilience. And you've said this is resilience engineering. And I have heard this term, but honestly, we haven't discussed it. So I'm not oh, really, I can, I can imagine what it might mean. But uh, how does it look in practice? Yeah, so uh, resilience engineering is pretty new, I think. I mean, oh, it's not new in other, you know, physics and engineering and stuff like that but it's certainly new in the safety space and I think you might want to get onto David Woods and and those guys uh they they're kind of the, the people that talk about this a lot and I think it fits beautifully in here because it's really about enhancing the like the positive kind of capabilities of people to be able to do their job safely and um and really understanding that it, that adaption um so this is a lot around helping understand how people um, keep their controls reliable in the field and um, how they manage to most of the time um, do work not aligned to the process but actually still have success. So it's really about understanding that richness of, of daily work. Um, but it's also about, you know, this expectation that things will go wrong and, and not denying that and planning for that. What are our, what redundancy can we put in place uh, to make things go right? What's our plan B? And um, and really having that um, at a mindset of leaders as well. So, you know, leaders don't just kind of go, okay, we're going to do this work. We're going to do it at the same time as this work here. Planner, go make that happen. Um, everybody, you know, turns up on the day and you get your stuff. There's, um, there's very much um, forward thinking about what could go wrong, if that happens, what can we do differently to make sure that people are still safe and we fail safely? Uh, you know, how will we physically do this and still be successful when it doesn't go to plan because we assume it's not going to go to plan? Um, so there's very much that forward thinking and, um, you know, there are a lot of usually a lot of people involved in that. Um, so that's the first part. That's really the anticipation of the failure and, and being able to respond when um, or have a backup plan. And then the other part is really around um, having this kind of um, capability to contain failure quickly so it doesn't escalate into, um, into you know, big consequence. I think that's probably the right way to put it. So you can fail 
and you can have no consequence. And that, you know, near miss kind of um, idea, the really good HROs practice that a lot. And it's not just an annual, you know, fire drill. Um, they're really getting into scenario-based training and starting to imagine how things can go wrong and putting these great um, scenarios together. And um, actually the mining company I'm working with at the moment is very good at this. They, you know, when they do their, um, their practices of um, underground evacuations and things like that, or they, they plan all of these like, you know, little side issues to happen um, there'll be people picket, picketing out the front. There'll be, you know, all sorts of things happening. and But that's actually what happens when failure happens, you know. They're, it's never straightforward. It's never like everyone can evacuate out through the main exit and they'll wait on the hill. You know, it just doesn't happen like that. Um, yeah, so just getting a bit of imagination, putting the complexity that really is and then practising that over and over is really, really important. I think um, – emergency management and perhaps the military both know a little bit about that, like practicing disaster scenarios and, you know, like, okay, we know what to do if there's an earthquake. Great. What if, what if it's winter as well? Oh, we didn't think of that. Yeah. Yeah. That's so, exactly yeah, right. The yeah. side issues that you're talking about. And and most organizations, like, you know, when you go and do a management system audit, uh, which I never, um, that's not my passion at all. It's actually something I try and avoid like a passion. Um, but You know, I remember back in the day doing management system audits and they would say, um, have you got an emergency management plan? And that would be what people cared about. But um, there's a, um, you know, everyone's got a, what's the saying? I think, and I always get this wrong. I think it's Muhammad Ali. Um, Everyone's got a plan until they're punched in the face. Um, There's something like that. Really, your plan goes out the window and it's all about your experience and and your ability to work with the people around you and, um, you know, have a, a basic framework um, to be able to work together um, outside of the normal hierarchy you know so have you heard of the AIMS system? No. AIMS is like a Australian incident management system and it's actually this really cool little framework which um, just sets out roles that a company can use but also um, like a, a national emergency response can use and a you know all of that and so they're all actually thinking in the same framework and those kind of structures actually help you to be very, um, you know, resilient and to recover quickly because, you you know, you don't have to go through all that thinking up front. Everybody knows who the incident controller is. Everybody knows, um, you know, who's um, managing the resources, you know, who's supposed to go get the trucks, you know, go and sort more water, all of those kind of things. And having those basic thinking frameworks um, that multiple companies and multiple organisations can uh, work together is, is something that is really, really important in in basic resilience. I think it's I think that's like incident command system here. Yeah. But to me, yeah, it occurs to me that it's like it's like giving people the tools to improvise, knowing that they will have to. Absolutely. Um, and then the last one is a deference to experience. So when I read that, I I always think, whose experience? anyone everyone is have we been paying attention to the wrong experience maybe yeah it's um experience and expertise so you know and those things are are sometimes different so the obviously the expert is the kind of technical you know go-to person the technical guru and the experience is usually somebody who has been doing that for a long time and has seen all of the things that go wrong uh i always um uh, I remember, my, so my uncle works in construction and he always, he's, he's a construction manager and, um, and he's always going on about the architect. So the architect's probably the expert and the construction manager is, you know, he's the experienced guy. And um, uh, we were having this conversation and he's like, he, he designs these things and they, you know, they sound good on paper and then I try and implement them and they don't work and but then he knows that they're so much better when they work together uh, and they get a much better outcome, you know, when they come together. And I think that's the same in any, uh, you know, in any kind of experience, expertise type um, type arrangement. So, you know, the, the first part of that is the expert. Yeah, I, I think what I'm trying to explain here is whose experience, um, whose expertise is, um, it's a bit of both. It's a bit of technical and it's a bit of long-term um, all the ways that things can fail and um, and they tend to work better together. 
Um, but what you find in most organisations these days, especially as cost cutting has happened, Mary, is we tend to move our experts to these central um, functions. So, you know, our key engineers are not based on sites anymore or, you know, the people planning the work even uh, who have expertise are not are not based next to the people who are doing the work. And the challenge with that is as soon as you get that divide, um, you really start to, well, I suppose you, you, you just don't do the work as well and you don't get the feedback loops back to the experts so that they plan the work better and better. You can't change, you can't do the work as planned and you can't change the plan according to what's coming up in the work, right? Like- yeah, that's right. And when things do go really wrong, especially in, you know, situations where if you're at a control panel and, you know, you you are dealing with a situation you've never dealt with before and it's not in the manual, you're relying on whether you've dealt with that before because you don't know how that control panel is designed and you don't know how that system is is designed and you need your your expert right next to you to, you know, to to kind of um, have that banter and really solve that problem together. And that's what HROs are really good at is they recognise that their experts need to be very accessible to their ex- experts, um, their frontline people, and, um, you know, they have they build close relationships with those people as well. So I'm, I'm going to zoom back out a little bit now and ask, what are the biggest challenges that you see facing occupational health and safety in the next 5, 10, 20 years? Like this is about as big a question as I could ask. <laughs> oh, look, I don't think things are getting any simpler. We certainly, things are getting more complex. Uh, I believe AI is going to be a really big uh, challenge. Uh, it'll bring so many good things as well. Um, I'm, you know, I've got to say I'm chat GPT, checking it out, seeing, you know, every day, um, you know, finding out more and more and learning more. Um, I think um, if we're not careful, um, as a safety profession, we are learning a lot. But what I notice in companies is we're still not really transferring that learning to our leaders. And so, you know, resilience engineering, HOP, all of those things, they're they're fantastic techniques and and tools and everything associated with that. But, um, you know, as safety profession, we kind of have to, decide what is best for our company and then teach our our company the why behind it whereas I think we're we're really good at just going let's implement learning teams let's do this you know and we don't really um, put the background to it and um, and help our leaders understand why we're moving in that direction so I think we've got a probably one of the biggest challenges is we're learning heaps as a profession we need to bring everybody else on the journey I think that's probably the uh, one of the big things and certainly technology yeah I think persuasion is uh, the more I talk persuasion and and teaching and understanding because you have to get the resources to uh, change the way things are done. What single, so there's two ways to ask this next question. What single change in the safety profession do you think could have the most far-reaching positive consequences? And the more fun way to ask that is if you had a magic wand and were granted one wish to improve OHS, what would it be? It would be to implant in every person's head we, that every failure is a systems failure and it, it almost never is it just um, the front line, uh, you know, is it the human error thing. Uh, it's something we talk about lots but um, I still don't think it's sinking. It's sinking into most safety profession but not into, you know, into, um, into daily leadership still some really old school thinking out there. We need some more cultural absorption going on. Yeah. At the board level, it's the board executive level that really aren't uh, aren't absorbing this. And, you know, it starts with, uh, so we have a, it's called the Australian Institute of Company Directors. And, you know, those guys almost are not listening, you know. So they're the people that set the um, the curriculum almost for boards uh, you know they're the, they're the courses that that people do to become company directors and they're still in the old school profession and you know well, anyway it's uh yeah it's it's very frustrating it's that that you know people people don't see these these uh, as as the the next way of thinking I think there's sometimes a, a, relux- a reluctance to change as well unfortunately but uh, I think most humans are have a difficult relationship with change. Yeah. What is giving you the most hope for the safety profession? 
where do you see hope? As well as being dangerous, I think technology, because a lot of the, you know, the problems with, if I think about the front line and, uh, you know, just yesterday I was underground, I don't know how many kilometres underground uh, at a at a coal long wall and the ability for people to still get access to the things that they need to access uh, in terms of the information is some, um, you know, it's still a challenge and and we're still very paperwork based when it comes to the front line. We're all, you know, we're all techie everywhere else and it's not it's not just coal and it's not just underground. It's actually everywhere. It's remote sites, it's, you know, lots of things. So I I think the biggest challenge is um is definitely still um, you know, the way we can move forward is really linking, making it easy for people to get the information they need in the format that they need it. Yeah, there's never been a better time, really. <laughs> so I'm going to go to the questions that I ask every guest. Uh, and the first one is about training the next generation of safety professionals. So if in terms of interpersonal skills, what do you think would be the most valuable to integrate into safety curricula? Like, a skill to develop that that's really going to help safety professionals once they get out in the work world? Uh, the ability to influence. So I think it's, uh, you know, just those basic kind of influencing skills. Uh, I think we still, a lot of the time, are very good at flinging shit over the fence and thinking, you know, and judging rather than um, seeing ourselves as coaches and, and mentors and, you know, taking people on the journey. Um, yeah, I still see that quite a bit in the safety profession. And, and I think it's a shame because that's our role is to, to coach and mentor and um, get beside people and, and help them be better. If you could go back in time to the beginning of your safety career, what's one piece of advice that you might give to yourself? Uh, look, it would probably be not to be, it, it would be the exact thing that I just, just said there is, um, is to recognize that, um, that I'm there to help and that I don't actually know what goes on in the front line until I go and ask. And I would, the other thing, you know, I've, I've moved industries a bit, which I've done on purpose, very, very, very purposely. And I always said to myself before I started the job, I was going to go and spend a couple of weeks outside of safety just with, with the workforce. And unfortunately, you're never really given that opportunity or very rarely are you given that opportunity to, you know, go spend two or three weeks out on the job just just shadowing teams and learning about work and how things really operate but um oh goodness for functional people and and it'd be hr it'd be safety it'd be you know any of the engineering functions any of that kind of stuff if if companies would recognize that um that the people who were all trying to serve at the front line uh to make things easier and better for them uh then it would be almost something you would build in is a month just on the job before you go into your role so that would be something that I would have done differently as I would have almost negotiated that it would be a good onboarding practice for most roles really <laughs> yeah yeah so how can our listeners if they're interested in some of the topics that you've talked about and realizing that the idea of HROs is is not new but if they want to learn more where would you steer them towards books or websites or anything like that. I definitely steer them towards any of Andrew Hopkins stuff, Professor Andrew Hopkins um, out of um, Australian National Uni in Australia. Um, but there's also an awesome book called Extreme Operational Excellence uh, by, it's the US um, Navy and it's by um, Matthew DiGeronimo and Bob Kuntz and it's pretty new actually, it's only a few years old. But it's such a good book. It is just, it's, it, you know what I love about it, Mary, is it's all practices. It just takes you through all the practices they use in the organization um, to really actually get high um, excellence. But, um, but it's all HRO theory. It's just beautiful. <laughs> if our listeners wanted to reach out to you, where could they find you on the web? Yeah, I'm on LinkedIn. Uh, and also I work for Brady Hayward, so you can just jump on our website, bradyhayward.com.au, and, um, and check us out. Or we speak quite a bit around the country and overseas, so, uh, yeah, you can uh, come and listen to one of our stories around big failures, and then we, we usually dissect those afterwards and talk about the systems issues and, um, and the learnings out of those. Good, and we'll, we'll have those linked in the, in the description. Well, that's a wrap for today's discussion. Um, 
Thanks for listening, listeners. And don't forget to rate, review, and share the podcast. And we, me and listeners, appreciate your time and insights, Jody. Thank you very much. Appreciate the offer and the opportunity. And my thanks to the Safety Labs by Slice team, highly reliable since the beginning. Bye for now. Safety Labs is created by Slice, the only safety knife on the market with a finger-friendly blade. Find us at sliceproducts.com. Until next time, stay safe.